the idea of just being one thing never uh, occurred to me, but it was, uh, it's like, I want to be a cartoonist. Uh-huh. I want to be an Olympian swimmer <laughs> and I want to be a trash man. First I got your voicemail, then I got you. But we can meet in person or maybe on Zoom. So tell me what's your genre, tell me what do you do? I'd like to know the things that specifically make you you. Hi, I'm Tim Barnes. You are the genre. And in each episode, I ask one cool person the three questions. What was the first genre that inspired you? What was the first craft that you pursued? And how do you feel about that pursuit now? This episode features an interview with one of my closest friends. Some might say my best friend. I might say my best friend. I'll just say his name now. It's Ian Abramson. We met each other in Honors English freshman year of high school at Vista Del Lago High School in Moreno Valley, California. We moved to Chicago together in February of 2012 in the vague, epic pursuit of a life in comedy. And it's safe to say now that both of us have done some really cool things in that space. Ian has done a late night set on Conan. He has appeared as characters in various TV shows and commercials. And now he has an awesome debut stand-up special called The Heist that's available to purchase everywhere on the internet. When you've known someone as long as Ian and I have known each other, it's kind of weird when you say, hey, can I interview you? But I think it also immediately gets the conversation onto a level that would take about an hour to get to otherwise. And this show is just an hour long, so that's perfect. Ever the rule breaker, Ian bends and contorts with the dynamics of the structure of the show, which is all for your delight, and I think led to a few surprising insights for both of us. So please enjoy this conversation with the one and only Ian Abramson. I'm talking... I thought what you just said was racist, but that's okay. Let's go on. (laughs) Talking to people who I feel are very much their own genre, this is going to (laughs) be... An interesting one because we know each other so well. But you, you, you're you aware of what the core questions of the show are. So let's just start at the beginning. What was the first genre that caught your attention in your youth? The first thing I remember being obsessed over was the Ninja Turtles, which has a lot to do with when I was becoming obsessed with things, right? Like I was born in 88, so I was kind of like, if anything, just a tad too young for the Ninja Turtles, but that yeah. meant it was hitting me the way Paw Patrol hits kids these days, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. like <laughs> instead of like, hey, maybe cops aren't so bad. <laughs> it was like, if you go in the sewers, you'll meet true freaks, which is is like true. It's a, it's a response to Reaganism. Let's be real. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's what I was really drawn towards. But what's interesting about the Ninja Turtles is that it was created as a response to the dark superhero trend of things like Frank Miller and Alan Moore and kind of like taking comic books seriously. But that means that those were in response to the kind of Stan Lee, what if Spider-Man was taken seriously, (laughs) which is in response to the Silver Age of what if we just had a good time, which is in response to the Golden Age of like, oh, God, we have superheroes now, which my point is, is like by the time you got where I'm obsessed with this genre. Yeah, it's literally a teenage mutant ninja version of itself, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I think you're one of the first people that I ever met who was aware of the fact that the Ninja Turtles started off as a underground comic. I think the first time I ever saw them was because of you somehow. Were you uh, drawn in by the comic first or the the animated uh, oh i mean i was a child it was literally like paw patrol for me like i had a ninja turtle birthday party you know like the the com the comics are very fun and cool and they're yeah. sub- they're truly subversive they look hand drawn mm-hmm. they it it's closer it feels closer to a zine than a comic book as we think of it yeah but uh, of course, that wasn't my intro. My intro was the toys <laughs> and the cartoon. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and those those were so colorful and creative. Like, what is the genre of the Ninja Turtles? It feels similar to the Power Rangers in that there is a group of teenagers hanging out. But there's something a little more underground and 
when I think of the Ninja Turtles, even the cartoon that we were seeing as kids, somehow I pair it on equal footing as the movie Hackers. Like this, uh, wow. <laughs> like, I think it's like the movie Hackers for kids, where you. Just... <laughs> 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 where wow. I assume that uh, the particular joy is like, oh, this is like the ideal group of friends to be hanging out with. We eat pizza, we're underground, we have a sensei, we fight. <laughs> we, we... <laughs> like, what, like what, what are the like the personal connections to you outside of like, oh, this is just really fun. What do you think you were getting out of it as a kid? They were funny and they were cool. They said words like cowabunga, which <laughs> is like, I mean, that that's a fun word. You know what I mean? They had weapons, which were cool, you know, and they weren't guns, which made it probably a little more palatable for parents. I remember my parents were iffy on the fact that they did have weapons. Mm -hmm. The culture was very weird back then <laughs> of like, <laughs> I, my, like I, I was watching rated R movies from the time I can remember, but we could not watch the Simpsons. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. like m my dad was a big, was very into movies and special effects. So I remember like there would be really truly gory magazines just everywhere and he would just say, it's movie magic. It's movie magic. <laughs> and I, but then my mom was like, we can't watch the Simpsons. Oh, you wow. Know? Yeah, what was a, your dad's opinion on, on that Simpsons? They were both teachers. And so that meant that he would have like shitty teenagers be shitty. And then he would go home and see on the news how the Simpsons is ruining oh, culture wow. and oh, be like, God. yeah, that's probably true. You know, <laughs> I, I, he was, he really did not like Adam Sandler. He thought that Adam oh, wow. Sandler was doing an impression of someone that had some kind of mental deficiency of some kind, like maybe a disability or something. But he thought that that was a big part of the joke. And both my parents taught, I don't know if you, how you would group them. My mom taught special ed and my dad taught kids that were labeled emotionally disturbed. Mm -hmm. So he was sensitive to the portrayal yeah, yeah, of yeah. bad kids. That is so compelling. I never put this together, this idea of two parents who go to school to work and then come home with all of this very specific school baggage. <laughs> it's weird. And you, I, I was probably, it took me till middle school to realize that like I knew about the inner workings of being a teacher more than the other students. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I knew all about an IEP, uh -huh. which is an individual education program, I think. Yeah. Uh, but it's when like a student needs a particular set of things, right? If a child is in a wheelchair, they might need an IEP to be like, by the way, the day is going to work a little differently for them. And it could also be a million other things. But why did I know that in fifth grade? <laughs> I think I, I do lump you into like the, uh, there's certain friends like, you know, uh, Jason in high school. And I think also... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you, J Jason and Greg, I remember being like intimidatingly funny. Like I just remember <laughs> like you, like they felt like a tornado. People were excited when they walked in the door to be like, all right, now the fun started. <laughs> it was wild. Yeah. And, and, but I, you're people who saw through the veil of the school system in a way. Oh, interesting. I mean, we met freshman year of high school and I do think of that experience as basically for me, being Neo in that first Matrix movie. Not saying that I am the chosen one or that I got magical powers by the end, but that For your first... life, you're the chosen one? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, you, that's your hero's journey? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, that makes sense. But just that first quarter of the movie where yeah. it's just like, oh, wow, wow, this is what's really going on. To reinforce that, I remember... At first, your impression of me could be summed up as like, who the hell is this guy? Some version of that. But like, also, we kind of we got along, but we're also like, who who is this? Uh, but nobody else wanted to talk about things like Ninja Turtle comic books. So we were kind of just stuck with each other. But then the second half of the year... I was already involved in theater. And so somebody was like, oh, somebody named Tim Barnes signed up to be a tech. And I was like, Tim Barnes? I know what? From my English class? 
us, you know, which is like such a high school reaction. Like, I what know. a small, what a coincidence, <laughs> you know? Oh, my yeah. God. And truly, that was because of my mother. My mother knew I wanted to make movies and stuff. And so she's the reason I signed up for that. It was a great fit. And you were instantly a big part of that world. People, (laughs) that was when I realized for the rest of my life, I was going to see people instantly fall in love with Tim Barnes in a way that just made you kind of uncomfortable. Like you, like, like Jason and Greg could work a room. You would, you were this accidental magnet of like, everybody wanted to touch your hair. Everybody wanted to talk about your eyes and you wanted to be left alone. (laughs) Yeah. Like you were, you were just like, like arms, like, Man. Yeah. yeah. But I feel like a, a connection back to the Ninja Turtles is the fact that I remember <laughs> us bonding on just talking about comics as commentary on a past time of comics as commentary on a past time of comics. It was the ultimate X-Men comic series, which, if I'm not mistaken, came out after the initial X-Men movie and is sort of yes. taking on that realist style. <laughs> And the ultimate X-Men comics was like, yeah, it was like, this is my thing. And I feel like we maybe I got you into that or we just both bonded over that specifically. I don't remember how it started, but I remember that before long, between the end of the school day and theater, there was like a couple hours where we were supposed to study. And there was like a an assembly line of who had the comics and like we would be passing them along as we read them. <laughs> like everyone like, all right, who has five? Yeah. Because like none of, none of us had the kind of like money in our pockets to be getting all of that, but any of us could scrounge 20 bucks and get one of them. Yeah. So we owned like random <laughs> volumes, all of us. Yeah, that was like the coolest thing, getting that like uh, when bookstores started selling the volumes of comics and stuff. I feel like a cliche question for Ninja Turtles fans is who is your Ninja Turtle? Like for the Power Rangers, I'm the Blue Ranger. Billy. I'm the purple turtle, which is the Billy of the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> I remember as a little kid, one of the big ways that you end up choosing your favorite is who you end up playing as as a kid. And Donatello was kind of the last choice. That's the purple one. But to me, I was like, dude, these other guys have like swords and sharp <laughs> stuff. And this guy has a stick. <laughs> I like he's he's kicking as much butt as they are. But guess what? My mom lets me have a stick, okay? <laughs> like, like, good luck getting a sword. You know what? I'm gonna get so good with this stick. You know, like that's that's how it that's how it felt at the time. But then also, he was like the invention guy and the smart guy, which meant there were gadgets. And mm. so, when, by the time I was really even thinking about a favorite, I was definitely a Donatello man. So this is where uh, the podcast gets interesting, because with this information, we're going to somehow try and and figure out how it fits into the rest of your life. Ian, this is your life. What was the first craft that you pursued? Oh, man. (laughs) I remember... I think it was kindergarten or first grade. My answer to what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, <laughs> like the idea of just being one thing never uh, occurred to me, but it was, uh, it was like, I want to be a cartoonist. Oh. I want to be an Olympian swimmer <laughs> and I want to be a trash man. Those are the three things. That's how that's, you know, trash man will probably pay the bills. Uh cartoonist will be my passion and then swimming will probably be i didn't have these words as at this age (laughs) well it is interesting that is like a trinity of things to consider in your life like the practical reasonable garbage man Mm -hmm. fitness is important in your life and then balancing that with the with your (laughs) with your passion (laughs) as as a cartoonist yeah would you say that of those three things Somehow the cartoon element is what you officially pursued as a craft or how much of it was uh, the garbage and the and the swimming? The significance of the garbage was that it was a normal job. And also it was kind of weird. Even back then, <laughs> like I kind of just like wanted to kind of like have the weird guy vibe. I don't I don't know. You know, I don't really think about it or talk about it in that way. But I remember specifically being like. Dude, the garbage man drives this big truck that has like these weird <laughs> robot arms. Yeah, and everyone knows they make good money somehow. Everyone—that's yeah, the everyone first thing that. anyone yeah. says anytime. <laughs> 
you know, garbage men, they make good money. <laughs> uh, like, but how many people know a garbage man? That's the other thing. It feels I don't like think I've ever club. met. Yeah. I don't think I've ever met <laughs> someone that is specifically that job once. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. And I, the reason I know that is because I know I would have asked questions that I don't have answers to. Yeah. I guess you know? uh, saying as we talk about this, I'm realizing that the proper term is sanitation worker, I assume. It is not just weird then. that that not not back back then. Then. Not when I was in kindergarten. But, uh, but there is something badass about owning the term garbage man. Right? I'm a garbage man. A garbage man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But it also feel, it feels connected to the Ninja Turtles in the way because the Ninja Turtles kind Absolutely. of uh, live in filth, uh, gloriously live. <laughs> right. They're constantly yeah. upcycling their freegans. <laughs> yeah, I I love it. So there's so there's that swimming. I was on a swim team. And so like that was like the, the sport that I liked at that point. You could compare swimming to stand up in that there's there's definitely a competitive vibe. But also at the end of the day, it's you're solely competing with yourself you know like yeah. if two people go up on a show and if two people are racing in the water they're not bumping into each other they're not affecting each other right they're just both yeah. going as fast as they possibly can yeah it feels like stand-up is both a, a swim what do you call it a swim race a swim mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. A swim swim race mm-hmm. yeah a swim stand- race <laughs> stand-up is both a swim is that race. what people mean when they say the race card <laughs> okay all right or yeah, so sorry. What? Oh, oh yeah, stand up feels like it's both a swim race and a pool party. You know, it's balancing yes, those it two does. vibes. So, like you have to be able to to float uh, <laughs> between, between use your floaty and go between social circles. You know, get to the deep end comfortably, and uh, For sure. then be able to be able to, to race. Yeah. For sure. I do remember I had a deep passion, though, for being a cartoonist. I will say that I did like I in my very soul, I wanted to do that. I was drawing constantly. I remember making up characters. You and I related over this. I like would be trying to map out a little cartoon world. Right. Or like uh, these are the characters that I keep drawing over and over again so that I can get better at them. And it's like these kid, come on. (laughs) My relationship with drawing, that's what I thought creativity was. Yeah, it makes sense. Even in high school, you were, I feel like it was, it was consistently like ensemble characters of this specific memory of a character of a, like a superhero you created who, who, uh, um, sweats, uh, um, gasoline of some sort and lights it on fire. I thought it was really cool. I still think it's really cool. I listen, uh, I think about that guy sometimes. I can't lie to you. you I can't lie to you. I've never, I think about I've never it. seen anything like it. He's a great character. This Someone is who, so like who so these, these, these <laughs> yeah, flammable lie, liquid. You know? So he could spit and light it on fire. <laughs> yeah. He could pee. <laughs> if he ran a mile, he could, you know, like I uh, yeah, it was it was fun. It, it was uh it was like a combination that that was like it was like X Men and Sin City. That was mm. the vibe. It was like combining those things, and I somehow didn't realize that's what I was doing. You know? <laughs> yeah. You also really loved Mystery Team. Are you talking about Mystery Team or Mystery Men? I love them both. Oh wait, wait, Mystery Men, Mystery Men, yes. and then later mis- Mystery Team. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I knew. Yeah, it was like <laughs> we're ju- we're jumping ahead to Mystery Team. That's a different foundational piece of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it feels like the DNA of the Ninja Turtles is still in oh, there. For sure. You love for a sure. ragtag group of people coming together. So much. These days, it's heists. I'm all about heists, and it's the same thing. Friends getting together <laughs> to pull something off. Oh, I love it. What about those three things? Uh, we both ended up getting into comedy, and I feel like we fueled each other with our interests in different comedians in high school and stuff, and then... At some point after a couple of years of college, we both ended up pursuing this really heavily and in an abstract way. We just wanted to do comedy. So we did a little bit of improv and stuff, but uh, really had a, a bit of a laser focus on stand up there for a bit. We clearly wanted to do something creative. We didn't know exactly what it was, but everyone that we knew wanted to do something creative. Right. So like we would get together and watch movies that we didn't care about. Sometimes we watched, we watched so many movies that we did care about, but sometimes we would give ourselves homework of let's check this off the list. We would watch directors commentary. We would, we did this for like nearly a 
decade, we would both be reading these like it would be like a show business biography. Oh yeah. And yeah. we would fully read it. And then mm-hmm. we would spend hours talking with each other about it. I know so much <laughs> about Louis Armstrong <laughs> because of you in that way. I don't know almost any, I know the very basics, you know, I would fail a Wikipedia test yeah. on Louis Armstrong, but I know about <laughs> his, his, the, the evolution, the arc of how he was perceived in the black community. So, so clear. Clearly through the lens of Tim Barnes. Yeah. uh, For some reason, when we moved to Chicago, that was one of the first books I, I got from the library. It was, uh, was this really big, uh, biography of, of Louis Armstrong. How would you describe the confluence of things that led to that for you though? Like this interest in wanting to be a comedian. Genuinely, the feeling I remember is fear that's fear that I was going to wake up at the age I am now and be like, Oh, (laughs) I have a kid. Mm -hmm. I like, I can't go off and do that. I can't now. Right. Like it would be, it would be messed up. Right. Which is, I think what a lot, like (laughs) maybe I was like, I better get ready for my midlife crisis now. You know, (laughs) both you and I, we were in honors English, but neither of us were good students. Mm. And that gave us this sense of like, we can keep up with smart people, but also like, we can't like do the work in the same way. Like there's a mental block. I'm not, I'm not going to be the straight A student. That's not in the cards for me. That's not me. I, if I put all of my energy into that, I might be able <laughs> to do that, but then I'm not going to be having a social life, which seems to be more of a strength of mine, yeah. you know? Yeah, for, yeah. For me, it was like I I didn't understand one the joy of it. That seems to be what people hype up about getting good grades. Like, and then also an element of the the practicality of it. I also I just didn't understand how it added up. And I feel that that's just a fault of mine. I I, I try really hard to be the type of <laughs> the type of person who who understands like, oh yeah, I, I do this and then and then I'm happy because I did it all. <laughs> In high school, you learn about Plato's The Allegory of the Cave for like 45 minutes. But that was the kind of thing that you would then get obsessed with for a month and fully read. (laughs) And like the problem was, was that you kept looking out of the cave (laughs) and you then became aware of it. And this is once you found out the connection between the allegory of the cave and the matrix, it was over. You never did homework again. Like, (laughs) like you were like, wait, this is like really all bullshit. Like, I'm not saying we're in a simulation, even if that's a metaphor, homework doesn't matter. Like, it was, and like, it was not in a, it didn't feel rebellious. It felt afraid. It felt like you were shaking people. Like, don't you realize this doesn't mean anything? And like a teacher would be like, you got to care. And you would be like, please tell me why I would love to care. Give me a reason. I would like, give, give me. Yeah. 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 Uh, Well, I think what's interesting about, uh, I mean, how we both attacked comedy was that we both kind of created characters. I think you created a very, like, you on stage is not the real Ian Abramson in a sense. Sure. I mean, everyone on stage isn't the real them, but you really created uh, a version of yourself. So I wonder if you can describe who, who you are on stage. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I don't know if I've ever been just asked that directly like that. Um, <laughs> people, people will dance around it, but because you know me, you're just like, I, I, but I'm afraid to ask him this. I, <laughs> I, the, okay. So you would think it was like meticulously planned in a way more than it was. But I remember we, we read from so many comedians. I, mm-hmm. uh, we, we read like we would look up interviews from the sixties. You know what I mean? Like rather than just watching a single documentary on Bill Cosby, we went over to his house and he served us drinks. Uh, <laughs> I don't need to go there. Um, the, <laughs> I don't remember what happened. The, I, uh, the point is, is that we, we really did research, right? Like we, um, and something that came up a lot was that the audience kind of tells you who mm. you are and what you do. And if you pay attention to it, it kind of develops and like any comedian, I was throwing anything against the wall 
But slowly I started realizing the most fun for me was playing like with the joke writing. We both very much love like the mechanics of writing a joke, right? We could play with that all day and we always have, right? Because yeah. like you could in the back of a classroom, you can spit jokes to each other, you know, like <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't need to pass notes or anything if you're careful. And by the end of high school, we'd gotten good at that. So we had just riffed so much and it felt like I was really learning what we were doing, figuring out how to do that. And it feels like I'm avoiding the question and I'm not trying to. My brain <laughs> well, let's, won't let's let get me to just the, answer the point. Directly. I mean, the big thing people want to know is why do you Sharpie a mustache onto your face on stage? I woke up one day and it was there. Do you feel like it's it's heightening elements of yourself because you are kind of a a professor that everyone's a little concerned about, I would say. Yeah. Homeless <laughs> professor is a phrase I used to say to myself to like get into the, yeah. Uh -huh. And and I know homeless is not the correct phrase, but again, we're talking 10 years ago uh, that I only said to myself. So, <laughs> but, but I, yeah, like that thinking of like a guy that wants to be elevated, a guy that wants to have his stuff together, but clearly is not. And it's helpful to make that instantaneous to, to deliver that message. It's helpful to have something, right? Yeah. Uh, and I have since learned that this is a major principle in clowning. In like, if you're studying clown, what is the first thing you think of of a clown? The ret knows, right? Like they go up and they let you know, hello, I'm not a normal person. I am a clown. And that's why I decided to grow out my mustache. <laughs> Well, it stands out to me that you described, you know, the, the main thing that you remember feeling before you got into comedy as fear, a uh, specific fear of adulthood in a way. And it feels like your character on stage is a parody of an adult. This is someone where <laughs> this is someone wearing a suit. <laughs> <laughs> someone uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 for very sure. seriously presenting a set of ideas and there's a playfulness to it, but I think overwhelmingly there's a seriousness that you have on, st on stage, uh, despite the absurd things that you're saying. Because I lean silly and absurd, I'm going after people that are talking about something that happened to them on the subway in a very real way. Also, like I've never, I've, we've never been drawn towards like vulgar stuff. We don't have a problem with it, but like, it's never, it feels, it feels kind of weird coming out of our mouths, honestly. <laughs> like, you know, like I don't, I don't avoid fart jokes because I turn my nose up at them. I like, they don't work for me. Right. Like it's a, <laughs> that's leaning into the, the grossness, the bad, you know, like mm -hmm. I need to play against that. I could be, I'm using balloon animals. It's very silly. Right. <laughs> and so I need to be very serious about those things. I need the attitude I try to have is like, you're going to laugh at this. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to laugh. This is my life. My <laughs> penis is a balloon animal and you're laughing at me. Yeah. That kind of vibe. You are also kind of an inventor as well. I forget what your Ninja Turtles name was, but Donatello. Donatello is a bit of an inventor. But have you ever considered the fact that both of your parents were teachers and that professor is a go to thought that you have? Dude, fr friend, <laughs> fr friends have sat me down and been like, it sounds like you're trying to teach us something all the time. And I'm like, <laughs> Fair enough. I will. I will try to address that. Teachers, of course, have their own patter. They have their I, man. Now I want to go and write a bit about the difference between like an airline pilot and a teacher how they're <laughs> talking. But like, yeah, it's it's definitely part of it. A lot of the stuff we were reading, if you're reading old comedy, you get a lot of like, don't wear shorts on stage, look better than the audience, which isn't stuff that I thought this is definitely true and relevant now, but it is interesting to think about. What are you presenting? You're giving a lot of information as soon as you stand on stage, right? Like what, what information are you giving? I like, I like thinking about that. I like incorporating that. And then I like doing something that seems absolutely impossible. Absurdism as like a philosophy comes down to contradictions, basically how like our brains kind of have to pretend like we're wrapping our heads around what is the point of life because it's impossible to really know or have a reason you can say like, I'm, you know what, I'm not going to worry about it anymore. Religion is my thing. And that's like, that's what I believe. And that's that that sort of thing can work. 
but then there's there's just a lot of contradictions and I like seeming like things are normal and then all of a sudden oh this thing that's impossible or ridiculous clearly has been there the whole time and can't be argued with you know I guess what it is is that you know it's not true but you can't prove it <laughs> you can't prove that my penis is not a balloon animal I'm telling you it is and I have the microphone what are you going to do about it you know that's the that's the vibe because nobody's fooled, right? It's it's different than a magic trick, right? In that it's not like, oh my god, how did he make that happen? <laughs> Everybody knows how I made that happen almost always, right? Like that's not the fun of it, but it's that I did just suddenly make it happen in a surprising way, hopefully. Don't scroll away. You are the genre. We'll be right back after the break. You Are the Genre is an independently produced podcast, so I appreciate everybody who has pressed that like button, pressed that share button, accidentally butt-dialed a nice comment on the Apple Podcast comment section. I appreciate it all. And if you'd like to give some financial support on top of that, there is a newsletter component to the podcast. Just click on it in the show notes or at youarethegenre.com, and there's a paid subscription tier there that is just your way of saying, hey, I appreciate this. And I like to get an email from you every now and then. I also use this section to promote things that I've been enjoying. Mainly, it's been Ian's new special, The Heist, available to purchase anywhere, which I think beautifully captures both his inventive writing and performance and a unique ability to open the door into his mind and invite the audience in there. Hopefully there's an exit. Maybe you don't want to know where the exit is. Of course, I've been enjoying Conan O'Brien's recent wave of interviews to promote his upcoming travel series on Max. Namely, the interview that everyone's been talking about, the one he had on Hot Ones. Conan O'Brien basically defined what comedy is to me. And oddly, when I met Ian in high school, I kept comparing him to Conan O'Brien, which must have been annoying, right? Maybe just because he was Irish, but also because they both have this interesting energy. In the previous episode, you may recall me lamenting WBEZ, the public radio station in Chicago's decision to shutter the Vocalo radio station. Vocalo is the reason that I got my first firm foot into the world of media, and so it will always have a special place in my heart, which was recently warmed by the fact that there is a new hashtag called Save Vocalo that you can interact with and ways for you to reach out and help out if you'd like that station to survive. You can call to leave a voicemail to hashtag Team Vocalo at 888-635-1112 or email info at Vocalo.org. Go to Vocalo.org slash contacts for more. And also, don't forget, there's a newsletter component to this show. If you'd like to support that, get all of the information you need at youarethegenre.com. Now, back to the episode. Where were we? I don't have a specific memory of the type of comedy you were doing in California before we moved to Chicago. But it feels like there was a moment in which Ian Abramson crystallized as a onstage persona in Chicago. Do, like, do, can you describe a bit of the alchemy leading up to you sharpieing a mustache on your face for the first time? I, I did that before I moved to Chicago for the first. Oh, you did? Time. Okay. Okay. I did, but but I do hear what you're saying. But it yeah. it it I. Uh... For me, of course, it felt like steps because every time I go on stage, it's an attempt at it and then I'm trying to learn from it. So when I get something right, it would feel like, okay, I'm figuring this out, (laughs) right? I remember doing an open mic early in Chicago, trying to do cartwheels. I remember oranges falling out of my pocket in an open mic. I must have seemed (laughs) the most obnoxious comedian in the world. And I was bombing. Let's be completely clear, like full on, not a little bit bombing. It was not fun. It was painful. It was hard. But I wanted to learn it so bad. I wanted to figure it out that I just kept trying to be like, let me let this drive me crazy. Because when I try to do like a storytelling kind of joke, it's not getting anything for me and it doesn't feel right. So (laughs) like, at at (laughs) least this is what I want to be doing. Yeah. Do you have that? uh, Because I I try and think of like how I have this idea of how I should be charting my growth as a comedian. And it feels like, you know, it should be that I'm getting more personal or, uh, but it just doesn't click in the right way. And I don't know if I'm trying to force that narrative on on the arc of how I think comedy careers should go. 
I guess I'm asking, how has your growth with stand-up and your stand-up persona as time has gone by, as the pandemic has swept <laughs> swept over us, and as we're kind of re-emerging into this new world, are there things that you're reassessing? All the time. I, I just moved back to Chicago to do stand-up much more. So I'm thinking about this all the time, the way I'm like holding a fork. I'm like, is this something, (laughs) you know, (laughs) all the, like everything. And what was the question? Uh, How did I evolve? How did you evolve? Yeah. And a part of it is that it feels like a lot of the momentum when we started, it it was this like exciting feeling of uh, getting away with something and kind of like attacking the scene and attacking the moment. And as I, we've been doing stand-up for 10 years now, the idea of like, oh, I can't believe I got away with that isn't exciting for me anymore. And so I'm trying to reassess. Like, <laughs> we've already gotten yeah. away with so much. We yeah. have to find something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah I get yeah. that. I get that completely. Trying to make anything of any kind, whether it's a song or a table or anything, I think Mike Nichols, I still am constantly watching interviews and reading things like this. Arthur Miller, I think, is into carpentry and he was saying like making a table it's just like writing a play and and he was saying that kind of at the end of the day you're trying to do less of anything that doesn't matter you're trying to remove the parts that aren't essential you're trying to boil it down and make it the best version of what it is for comedy thinking about what is true and what is, what you want to say and peeling back the layers of honesty. That's all part of it. That's all there. But then it's also, it doesn't have to be literal. We, we have a shared love of Richard Pryor, not just as a truth teller, but as a really like silly and creative yeah. joke writer. <laughs> and like everybody talks about how honest he is, but if that, like that man will talk about grief using a dog voice, you know, <laughs> like, and he, he's clear, he clearly has thoughts on grief and all, like there's all, all of that is in there, but he can just bake it into a really interesting piece. And to me, that's always fun to chase. These days, I'll try doing something like, okay, this is me. I'll try doing a little joke that is real. And honestly, because like it it feels so weird when I do it in the middle of a set now, because it's like, is that one supposed to be real? Yeah, Um, yeah. And it feels like you're breaking the character in a way. What is your relationship with the character now? Yeah, I, um, it feels like the car that I drive. (laughs) <laughs> and, I, and, and I love my car. That's how it feels. You know, like, I don't think about it. I don't think about it as a character. That's how I know how to do that, right? Yeah, yeah, if yeah. you said, give me a joke about being stood up on a first date, then I'm going to put it through that lens, right? Like, I'm going to think about that. Whereas someone else might be like, let's just talk about that feeling, that waiting, <laughs> that waiting feeling. And someone could like really spin a great joke out of just that. Yeah. But if I was doing that, then I'm probably going to be waiting a hundred years and, or I waited 30 seconds and I'm impatient. Like I'm, I, I, I have fun with that exaggeration, trying to explore that kind of thing. So I'd ask myself, what really is it about a date? being stood up on a date. It's embarrassing. They know, and you don't, there's a period where, where you don't realize you're being stood up. That might be what's instantly like, okay, that might be the, the, the interesting piece of that to me. So then what are other situations that I do that? How can I, you know, like I, I just, I, I love doing that, that nugget, that kernel. I really try to keep pulling back the layers and try to have that be a little deeper, have that be a little more honest, have that be a little, you know, because I like doing dog voices, so I better use them. I better try to use them as well as Richard Pryor does. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that's a, a healthy way of describing it, that the character is a car. And if anything changes, it might get a different paint job or something. Or right. Get a, it might install a new radio, but uh, it'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll always be this car that you you drive on stage. You ever get in somebody else's car and you're like, wait, where is the blinker? And then once you have it, you got it. It's like, I could do that with you. I know how to drive your car a little bit, right? Like I could sit in that seat and be like, how does Tim do this? And that's what it would feel like to do that as a, you know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like that's the goal of creating a character that is in some ways replicable or that other people recognize that. And that was always the most exciting thing about when we started in Chicago was like, 
seeing our friends get to that point or just recognizing that in the more established comedians already. Like this is how Danny Callis tells a joke. <laughs> like, oh, this, sure. is, this, is, this is the only way that the, <laughs> and everyone knows how to do a parody of that person. And that's actually the goal. Yeah. But I'm also fascinated. We were talking a lot about how we read a lot of uh, biographies and stuff. One of the great ones is Steve Martin's. I'm fascinated by this surreal moment that happens to certain comedians where they kind of put the character in a box <laughs> and on occasion they'll open it up for a show or whatever. But you get the sense that like, oh yes, this is neatly packaged into the past. I'm, ne- I'm never going to fully <laughs> go back into being the wild and crazy guy any- for sure. anymore. For sure. And Albert Brooks, the the new documentary that came out about him, the joy of watching that for me is him kind of being reminded by his friend over dinner of all these things and being like, oh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like that's on my mind lately because I'm deciding whether, you know, certain elements of the things I've done are going in a box or if I am going to keep wearing this suit. But we haven't tackled the final question just yet of what is your relationship to the initial craft that you that you pursued now you mentioned cartooning being a sanitation worker and swimming <laughs> i'm just interested in knowing what your feelings are about either the version of yourself in the past who had those pursuits or just those concepts as a whole right now i would say the last few years were Another attempt at like really like, okay, let me see if I can like figure out how to fully piece something like that together. And I realize I need like I, I should focus on my stand up, build that new material and letting that kind of be my guiding light as someone creative is helpful for me. And I just kind of know how to do that. I know how to drive that car. Right. And the way that I do that ends up getting I end I'm all, like I'm making so many little videos and I'm not even like putting out you know doing stand up makes me want to try something all the time every time I go up way more than I used to because what I used to do I used to try to like build a roller coaster on rails <laughs> that could go as well as it could uh-huh. because because it was risky but now I have more experience and I know how to in the first 30 seconds <laughs> let an audience relax and know that that things are okay and that I can be kind of funny and build up to some weirder stuff, you know, and it just kind of ease them into it. Something I'm opening with right now is like, uh, this is going to be a weird set. I should about 30 minutes ago, I had mushrooms and I'm allergic. What it says to the audience, I literally get to tell them it's going to be weird and then give them an example of how don't worry about the truth here. Are they thinking that? No. Does it work? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so how what is what is the relation to the early craft cartooning? To me, it's that Arthur Miller just peel back the layers, just peel back the layers. And when I do that, it makes me want to play. I'm friends with a lot of cartoonists. The ship has sailed on my on my art <laughs> abilities. And when we have a mutual friend, Charlie Rohr, every time I say that, he's like, you could draw. You just have to like, I'm like, yes, I could learn the how, like how big a rib cage is compared to a pelvic <laughs> bone. I could I could learn that stuff, but I don't like it's it's not a natural path for me. And that's fine. And instead The good news is that for people in animation, like (laughs) the animation world isn't hungry for artists, you know? (laughs) So like I can, um, I'm working with Lisa Peters and this, this animation duo draw bomb. A draw bomb is like figuring out how to improvise animation on Twitch. And I, right. That's instantly fascinating (laughs) and cool. And I, they aren't performers, so I literally just say to them, whatever you want from me. If you want a page of jokes, I can get that to you. I write quick. <laughs> uh, if you want somebody to read lines, like I feel super lucky that I get to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. They just drew a poster. We're talking about like figuring out how to animate some little things. I love playing in that space. To me, it really is all the same thing. Craft is craft right? How you do one thing is how you do everything. And how I draw is how I perform. I throw it up. I do the best that I can. I try not to worry about it. And I try to learn what I can from it. Drawing wise, that means that my drawing looks like a six-year-old. But you know, 
when a six year old performs stand up in a suit, it's pretty fun. Pretty funny. Yeah. You know who else drew like a six year old? Picasso. You brought up this idea of a roller coaster, and I feel like you've had a bit of a roller coaster of a in life career, of life and career. A, sure, yeah, yeah, totally. career in the industry. Yeah, uh, with some like great highs, like you uh, were on Conan. You've been in commercials. You've done a lot of cool stuff, and I just think it's really cool and compelling that you've landed back in Chicago to focus on the basics. It seems, but also in context of this post everything seeming life where it, it feels like a lot of uh feels like we were in the hobbit and now we're in lord of the rings <laughs> yeah yeah when i think about us starting off as comedians there were very glaring clear th- things to reach and aspire to and uh a part of the reshuffling that i feel like a lot of people are doing is <laughs> is because these things are just simply dissolving. I get the sense that you have a very positive nucleus of joy for all the things that you're doing and you're still excited about comedy and things. But uh, I guess the question is, what have you learned from this? Are you being propelled aspirationally or is it from a more humble place? It feels both. It it honestly, because I've, you know, I've had at different points in my career, you get a little success, you get a little hubris, and you have to kind of learn and go through all those things, which means now I'm coming, I have a different lens of that. I think my last couple years in LA were me trying to be like, I really want to figure this out. I really want to do this. I want to work however I can. And uh, in comedy, right? And I have been blessed with that not being nothing, right? Like I've gotten to do some cool things and comedy has gotten me some great day jobs. You know what I mean? (laughs) But also we're at a point now where it's like, okay, what do I want to have? What do I want to do? What, like, what, what do I want to build? Throwing myself into the Hollywood system (laughs) was hard. It was, it's not, it's, and the way that I work, I just said, I like to throw things against the wall. I like, I need to fail a lot so that I can figure out how to make something good. And there's not a lot of room for that. Uh, Hollywood needs something polished and ready to be shown to people, right? Uh, That's like a non-cynical interpretation of that. I realized getting back to stand up would let me really, it would, it's the easiest way for me to just shed those layers, pull back, see what I want to do and how I want to write. And I've got five minutes of stand up that's completely silent right now. And I'm, I'm, (laughs) I love that, you know, like that's, that's, that's the fun to me. How do you make that? Because it's it's easy to just not say anything. Yeah, is it yeah. easy to get laughs for five minutes without saying something? I could work on that the rest of my life. You know, <laughs> like I re- like I uh, that's something I can always pick up and start juggling. The other thing is that Chicago comedy is so community based, and there are kind of these like clubs, there are tribes or cliques or whatever you however you feel about it. All of that stuff is real, but also. If you're getting laughs, a comedian has to respect it. And a comedian, honestly, probably wants to respect it. Even if they yeah. don't like you, they're like, they're killing. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? All, yeah. We've all seen that moment. And they're, yeah, because we have banked so many hours of just listening to comedy at open mics and stuff. You know oh, when to sure. give a polite laugh because something just sounds funny, just the cadence of it. Yeah. Sometimes the cadence is the funniest thing and it's genuinely funnier than the joke is, totally. <laughs> is the case. Listen to stand up in another language and you'll get it instantly. <laughs> yeah, it's <yeah>. funny. <laughs> that was not a language. There's a specific sound to a respect laugh. So it's like, sure. it's, it can sound like a bark or something, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> that, that, that for some people, it's something like that in the back yeah, of the room where they're just like, they did it. Yeah. They f- it. Like watching them take off in an airplane for the yeah, first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure. <laughs> I yeah. So that's that's very real. I think when you're starting out, part of why you're doing comedy is because you have a lot of ideas about what good comedy is and what bad comedy is. And after a while, you start to that's that really starts to shift, right? Because someone like Bill Burr is about as different a genre from 
what <laughs> Bill, Bill Burr wouldn't do five silent minutes to stand up. <laughs> and, uh, but he would do all these other amazing things, right? You learn to appreciate them. You learn to not there, there are comics who have spent 10 years learning to absolutely kill at a club in the middle of nowhere. And the I remember the first time being in that situation. I was hosting at a club and a guy who I had heard so many people make fun of because he was just kind of this like hacky club guy went up and destroyed. He got applause <laughs> breaks and I had just eaten total. Shit. I had made it hard for him because I had done so bad as a host uh-huh. and he was in his element. Yeah. And since then, I've really done my best to have that be the judge. Right. The best part about comedy is that people laugh or they don't. And it gets complicated because people can reinforce some really terrible things through that. But I try to Think of it as like, okay, that that's why I need to be as good as I can be. I can't be lazy. I can't be, um, if that's important to me, I need to put that on the stage, right? Like I try to think that because I'm not going to argue with people. Uh, you'll, if you go to an open mic, you will hear a trans joke, right? You're going to. And I also don't want to be the person that is like trying to speak on those issues. Right. And it's like it's a hard thing to try and grapple with that. I'm always trying to figure out this can't possibly be related to the question. you asked. <laughs> well, There's I know way I just said the word <laughs> trans issues and <laughs> it had anything to do with this conversation. That was a wake up call for me. That was you. That was you drawing a, a, a vague idea of a new character. I told you I have to yeah. fail. I have to throw things <laughs> against the wall and then be like, "What?" Well, what I think is really cool about you having five solid minutes of not saying anything and yet getting laughs is that the idea of doing comedy for the aspirational thing of a special on a certain network. I feel like that's kind of fading a bit because everyone can put a special on YouTube or whatever, and it's bringing more attention to something that I know that you love. I, I, I do think that it does feel like a, a new version of, of vaudeville is actually the only thing that matters right now, like something that you could only see. Like, I'm sure that a documented version of you doing this thing for five minutes would be funny on a TikTok or a reel. I'd chuckle, then I'd flush my toilet, and then I'd tell then I'd tell someone about it. But it's nothing like being in a live space after the confluence of things that led up to you doing that. And I feel like that's that's like the real source of it all. And I feel like you're interacting with that. So I recorded a special about a year ago and you were at the taping and I know your laugh. So I like I, I, (laughs) I can, I can watch that and hear exactly how you feel about everything (laughs) because I know you and I know your laughs. But what's interesting is when you record a set like that, no matter what, it's like you're saying, it's going to feel different, right? It's not, it's not going to be the same. You can absolutely destroy and it feels like you're bombing when you watch the tape and vice versa. I've seen, I, I, you know, people have been like, dude, I felt like they were not really laughing. And then you watch the the tape. I don't know. The mics are good. Maybe it's sweetened. I don't know, but I, (laughs) but it's a great clip. Right. Uh And so you have the memory of the taping and you have the tape and what the special becomes to you is the thing in between. You're kind of combining those things. Like, didn't this joke do okay? Were they confused during them? Well, they're <laughs> laughing there, you know, like that. It, it's kind of a weird half of it is what you perceive. And half of it is uh, the empirical truth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like this is a good, can we get back to trans issues, please? <laughs> I feel like this is a this is a good place to end. Thanks for doing the show, Ian. Thank you for having me, Tim. <laughs> Big thanks to Ian Abramson for stopping by the show. For more information on the heist, 
And anything about him, visit ianabramson.com. That website is kind of a maze. Freddie Nunez created and sings the You Are the Genre theme song, and Adam Smith produced it. Next episode, comedian Carrie Coddett joins me on the show. But if you become a paid subscriber to the newsletter, you can listen to it a week ahead of the normies. This is Tim Barnes signing off with your weekly reminder that you are the genre. First I got your voicemail, then I got you. But we can meet in person or maybe on Zoom. So tell me what your genre, tell me what do you do? I'd like to know the things that specifically make.